Last week, we uh, talked about uh, time and space complexity, and we also took up the contest. And after that, uh, we did a bit of um, binary search. So uh, we did the most basic uh, form of binary search, which was checking whether uh, an el element existed uh, in a sorted array. And we compared the time complexity uh, of both of them. Um, so we, comp we compared the time complexity of uh, linear search and binary search. And we concluded that uh, linear search was uh, O of uh, n time and binary search was O of log n time. And with binary search, we were able to uh, pass the time limits uh, of the problem. So um, if you missed it, uh, there were uh, week two notes made by Evan. Uh, thanks to Evan. Uh, so you can uh, go to the um, senior uh, announcements here and you'll see the link to the notes here. And uh, if you want to see the uh, implementation for the binary search, um, it's right here. And uh, this week, uh, we're going to continue where we uh, left off uh, last week. So uh, last week, we did a little bit of uh, binary search. So uh, you, I guess you can open up the stock from uh, last week uh, if you want. Um, so we're going to continue to talk about binary search. Um, and we're gonna go through some more advanced uh, uses of uh, binary search. We're also going to talk about uh, binary search trees in C++. Um, but first, let's just do a brief review of uh, what we did for um, the most basic form of binary search last week. So um, we had this problem where um, hold on, I'm waiting for this to load. Okay, so we had this problem, uh, in case you don't remember, we had a sorted array of um, elements and uh, we had some number of queries and for each number we would output yes if we found the element inside these, this array and we would output no if we didn't find it and we use the property uh, uh, that the array is sorted to uh, limit our search space by half every single time and so therefore it took us log in uh, iterations each time until we reached our uh, uh, final verdict of yes or no. So our implementation, uh, you can find it uh, at the end of the notes here. Uh, there's a link to it. Oh, and we also posted the uh, GitHub link and you can also find it on there. So uh, the basic idea behind it was that um, we had a low point and a high point and that defines our search space. And we're, we said, uh, while the search interval is uh, not empty, so if the low point was smaller than or equal to the high point, uh, we would go, go ahead and pick the middle element uh, inside our search interval. And it, we checked whether it, if it was equal to the element. And if it was, then we said found equals true. So we would break out of this binary search algorithm. Otherwise, uh, we would limit our, um, if it was greater than the element, we'd, we would limit our uh, search space to uh, whatever is to the left of the middle element. And uh, otherwise, if it's smaller, we would limit it to whatever is to the right of the uh, uh, middle element and that would divide our search space by half every time because uh, we chose the middle element to begin with and uh, afterwards uh, we would output yes if we found it and no if we didn't so uh, are there any questions on uh, this implementation of binary search and uh, if you have any questions about this you should ask because uh, it's it'll be hard to understand whatever um, we're going to be doing next if you don't understand this Let me check the uh, chat. Um, I don't think anyone said anything. Okay, so uh, if there are no questions, uh, we're going to be looking at a slight variation um, on this problem. So to start off with, uh, this thing is kind of slow. Okay, so um, given an array of n numbers, again sorted in non-decreasing order and k queries, for each query print the minimum index of an array element not less than the given one. So um, you'll find that this problem is kind of similar to what we did before, uh, except uh, rather than finding whether an element exists, we're going to find uh, the minimum index of an array element that is not less, so that means greater than or equal to the given one. So again, we're given uh, a sorted array here, and uh, we're given k queries. So 
uh, let's say I wanted to find uh, w whether the find the minimum index uh, of an array element that is greater than or equal to two. And uh, if we were to again loop through it um, from the beginning to the end, um, the time complexity of that would be O of n. Um, and so, for example, if I wanted to find uh, if our element was greater than the last element, we would have to loop through the entire thing every single time, and that would obviously be uh, too slow. And uh, what we can do is very similar to what we did last week. We define our initial uh, search interval here. So we find the middle element. And we ask, um, is two, uh, sorry, is five greater than or equal to two? And five is greater than or equal to two. So um, since this is true, uh, we're gonna put, we're going to save our answer as the um, index of 5, since it wants the minimum index. So since 5 is greater than or equal to 2, anything that is greater than 5, let's call some random variable x, anything that is greater than or equal to 5 also must satisfy this condition. So um, we don't need to search for anything that is to the right of 5, because we want the minimum index. And 5 is definitely better than whatever um, is, on, is to the right of 5. So again, we limit our search interval uh, we divide our search interval by half and limit it to the uh, number of limited to the elements that is to the left of five. So we have the interval um, from three to three, and we can check the middle element again, and we find that three is greater than two, um, greater than or equal to two, and so we know any anything to the right again uh, is useless to us because we want the minimum index, and the index of three uh, finally it would be uh, one. And after that, we just uh, have an empty interval, in which case we would break out of our um, binary search algorithm. And so our final uh, answer went from 3 to 1. And so 1 would be our answer for um, the query 2. Now, if we were to um, try to search for the number 4, uh, we're going to use the same logic. So we begin with the uh, entire array as our search interval. And so we check 5, and we check um, whether 5 is greater than or equal to 4. Um, and that would be true, so we have the index 3. And let's go to, through this interval, and we check the middle element here. So that's 3. Um, 3 greater than or equal to 4 is not true, so this is not true. And we have to move our interval up, because anything to the left, or in, and including this element, uh, can't be greater than or equal to the current element. So we're going to in, divide our search space by half again. And again, 3 is not greater than or equal to 4. So uh, we can update our answer further. And our final answer would be 3. So uh, this binary search uh, implementation is actually very similar to what we had before. So uh, let's see what adjust adjustments we have to make to uh, make our um, algorithm work for this particular problem. So to save us some time, uh, I'm just going to copy our um, Im implementation from last week. And um, I'm going to uh, tweak it to make it work for this problem. So there are several uh, adjustments that we should make. So uh, the input doesn't have to change because we're still inputting uh, n elements. And so um, instead of this found element, we're not finding whether an element exists in the array. We're finding the minimum uh, index um, of an array element that is uh, greater than or equal to the given one. And also they said if there are no um, array elements that is uh, not less than the given one, then they say print uh, n plus 1. So instead, we're going to um, initialize a variable called answer. So let's initialize answer to n plus 1. So our low point is 1, the high point is n. That did not change because uh, our search interval uh, is still the entire array. Now uh, we're going to pick the middle element, and instead of checking whether it's equal uh, to the given number, we're going to check if it's greater than or equal to it. So if it's greater than or equal to it, um, it satisfies this condition that, uh, that it's not less than the given one. Then let's update the answer to the index of this element. So answer equals mid. And so now our search interval, um, since it is satisfied, we only have to check whatever's to the left. So uh, in the case of 4, uh, 5 is greater than or equal to 4, so now let's check whatever is left of 5. So uh, what we're doing here is we're setting um, our high point to the left of the middle point that we just chose, and we're saying high equals mid minus 1. And otherwise, um, if it's smaller than a, 
then we know that as we move right along the list, um, our elements get greater. The, so we have a chance to um, obtain an element that is uh, greater than or equal to the element. So we want to search whatever is to the right of mid. So we adjust uh, our search interval, so our low point, to be mid plus 1. And uh, instead of outputting yes or no, we're just going to output our answer. Whoops. Okay, so uh, that worked correctly, and uh, let's calculate the time complexity of this algorithm, and um, you'll see that not much has changed, so this loop is uh, O of n, and for uh, we're going to loop through k queries, and for each query we're going to go through um, where our search space is from 1 to n, and um, we're going to run our binary search algorithm, and we divide um, our search interval by half each time by setting our high point to either below the midpoint or a low point to above the midpoint. So finally, we're going to obtain our answer. Um, are there any questions about what I uh, adjusted here to um, make the algorithm work for this problem? I'll check the chat. Someone said something. Oh, uh, yeah, sorry. Don't, don't worry about that. Um, so if there are no questions, um, let's look at um, a very similar problem to this one, even similar than the last two, um, even more similar, I mean. I'm just waiting for this to load again. Okay, so this problem says, um, given an array of n numbers sorted in non-decreasing order again, uh, we have k queries, and for each query, um, it wants us to print the maximum index uh, of an array element that is not greater than the given one. So not greater means less than or equal to, right? So now uh, we're kind of doing the opposite of what we're, we were doing before. Before we were trying to find the minimum index that is uh, greater than or equal to, now we're finding the maximum index that is smaller than or equal to. So uh, if we have our example of two, um, we would find, and uh, they said if there are none, then print zero. So if we had two, then we would compare five to two. And five is uh, five smaller than or equal to two. That would be not true. And we have to limit our search space to uh, whatever is to the left of five because that would have a chance of being less than two. And uh, we search our minimal element again, and three less than or equal to two would still not be true. And so we can't update our answer again, and we are eventually left with an empty interval here. And so that means that our answer is zero because um, there are no elements um, here that are uh, that is less than or equal to two. Uh, and you can see here that the smallest, index, the smallest element in this array is three, so uh, three is not less than or equal to two. So therefore our answer is zero for this one. And if we take four as an example, again, we start off with our full interval. We took we take five and we ask, um, is five smaller than or equal to two? Uh, sorry, if five smaller than or equal to four and we find this is not true. So we limit our search space again. We pick the middle element and we check, is three smaller than or equal to four? And this would be true. And so our, let's update uh, our maximum index to 1, because that's the index of, uh, that we just checked. And so now let's lim erase everything to the left of it, um, just like how we, we erase them here. And we limit our search interval to the second element here. So is this element um, smaller than or equal to 4? Again, uh, 3 is smaller than or equal to 4. And now we have our answer of 2. Uh, and we're left with an empty interval, so we break out of our algorithm, and our final uh, answer is 2. So this right here. So this is a very similar problem to what we just did. What do we have to do to um, make, this, uh, make our algorithm work for this problem? Well, instead of checking whether it's greater than or equal to the number, uh, what we can do is uh, we just change that to what uh, the condition that we desire. So 
uh, not greater, so that's smaller than or less, sorry, smaller than or equal to uh, the number. And let's update the answer. And if it's satisfied, then we know that we only need to check uh, whatever is to the right of the midpoint. So instead of saying high equals mid minus one here, we'd say low equals mid plus one. And otherwise, uh, we would say uh, high is equal to mid minus one. So otherwise, if it's greater than the given number, then we would adjust our search space to be whatever is to the left of it. Um, or in other words, whatever is small, smaller than the middle element that we picked. And so um, instead of uh, initializing our answer to n plus one, let's initialize it to zero uh, in case um, the answer is never updated here. Uh, we would output uh, what they want us to output, which is zero. So let's run our program. And that would give us uh, the correct output for this problem. So um, are there any questions uh, to this problem or the problem before? don't see anything. Um, anyways, if you have uh, any questions at any point, uh, feel free to ask. Um, otherwise, we'll just uh, move on. So let's look at um, our first uh, real problem today. So uh, we have a long piece uh, of timber with length of L meters. And so let me make sort of a diagram here. Um, so let's say the length of our uh, piece of timber was five. And uh, for each um, one, two to L minus one, there's a mark called mark X uh, at X meters from the left end of the piece. So uh, if we made some cuts here, um, there would be, it would be labeled zero, one, two, three, four, five. Now it didn't actually say to label uh, zero and five, but um, it said to label from one to four if the length is five, but uh, we can label zero and five just for, um, you'll, you'll see later why we do that. And we're given Q queries, um, the i of which is represented as a pair of numbers, uh, ci and xi. And let's process the queries. Uh, and it says uh, if ci is, e is equal to one, then let's cut the piece at mark xi into two. And if ci equals two, then choose the piece with mark xi on it and print its length. And uh, this is a little bit confusing, so I'm going to show you uh, with a sample what they mean. So f five is the length of the timber, and q is the sorry three is the number of queries they're going to give us. So these are the queries. So two two says uh, take the piece of timber that uh, has mark two on it and print its length. Well, we haven't made any cuts yet, so this entire piece of timber is of length five. So the answer for this query is five. Um, one three says make a cut at mark three. So let's make a cut here. So now we are left with um, a piece with um, of length three and another piece, piece of uh, length two. So, um, and then it says query two, two again. So find the piece with mark two on it and print its length. And so we can see that uh, this section has been cut off. So we're only left with this piece of wood. So now um, the length of this piece of wood would be three. And so five, three would be our uh, answer for this uh, sample input here. So um, does everyone understand this problem? Are there any questions? Okay, um, so what it's saying is uh, you have there are two operations. Um, you either make a cut at some point or you uh, find the piece of timber um, at a specific point and then uh, output the length of it. 
and we can essentially uh, rephrase the problem um, as something that we do know how to solve. So let's find uh, what is the first cut to the right of uh, mark X. So let's try to answer, um, whoops, query two. So it wants us to output the length of the piece of timber that uh, has mark X. So it'll come in the form uh, CIXI and X, XI is the X that I'm referring to right here. So uh, we wanna find the first cut to the right and w what is the first cut to the left of mark X. And if we know these two things, um, then all we have to do is output the difference uh, between the positions of the cuts, right? So let's pretend that zero is cut and uh, five is cut because they're the beginning and the end and it'll make our life a little easier if we do that. So um, initially when we didn't have the cut at th uh, three, um, the first cut to the right would be five and the first cut to the left would be zero and five minus zero would be five. And um, after we made a cut at three, um, our first cut to the right would be three our first cut to the left would still be zero. So um, three minus zero was three. And that was our length of the piece of timber that two was on. So um, we know that this is um, these two questions are actually very similar to what we just did, right? So if we go back to the uh, problem that we just did, um, this says for each query, print the minimum index of an array element not less than the given one. So it wants to, um, print the smallest index that satisfies some condition. Here, um, for the first question here, we're essentially asking, uh, what is the smallest index to the right of the first cut? Um, and for our second question, that is very close to what we did here. So this says print the maximum index uh, of an array element not greater than the given one. So um, this uh, that is very similar to saying, what is to the left of uh, mark X? So we know that uh, if we had a sorted um, array or vector of uh, numbers, so of the positions of the cuts, we can um, binary search for both positions, right? So, so now the difficult part uh, is um, uh, query type of type one here. Uh, it says cut the piece at mark XI into two. So we have to insert a cut um, at, for example, at position three. So how um, how can we uh, insert a cut into, um, or let's say, how can we insert a number uh, into our sorted array or vector? So now um, if we try to implement a sorted array or vector um, with the actual um, just primitive arrays like uh, like array or use a vector um, like that, um, what you'll find is um, yes, you can binary search for the position that you want to insert your element at. But um, for arrays, there's no easy way to insert an element uh, right into some position that you want. And for vectors, um, there is a method that you can do this with. For example, if you had a vector in V, and I talked about this uh, in our in the first week, but if we did V dot insert uh, position and uh, number, it would insert um, this number at this position. Um, however, there is a problem here. So um, this operation here is actually uh, O of N, whoops. Uh, with respect to uh, the size of, sorry, the number of elements that is to the right of the position. So let's say uh, our vector was one, two, six, seven, uh, whatever is in here. And let's say I wanted to insert uh, eight at the front of the vector. What it would become is eight, one, two, six, and whatever, uh, whatever else we have in our vector. And so what this is doing is that it's pushing everything else back one uh, one spot and it's uh, putting eight at the front and setting the first element to eight. 
So that is actually not a constant time operation. That would actually be a linear time operation. Uh, and the size of our uh, vector, our sorted vector, can uh, grow up to as many queries as there are. And if we look at the constraints here, Q goes up to 2 times 10 to the 5. So if we had uh, 2 times 10 to the 5 um, queries and we kept on inserting it at the beginning, uh, we would get um, approximately uh, n Q squared number of um operations that we, our time complexity comes down to around uh, O of Q squared. And so uh, if we work that out, that would be something like four times 10 to the 10. And we know that C++ runs uh, 10 to the eight. And so obviously we can't spare it to be uh, 400 times slower than, we can't spare 400 seconds for our program to run here. So um, there's no easy way to insert a number into our sorted uh, array or vector. So that's our problem. So now I want to introduce uh, something that is an ordered set or uh, a set uh, in C++. So uh, a set in C++ is different uh, than a set uh, in Python. Um, so sets store uh, unique elements uh, in sorted order. So, and I put this in quotations because um, it's actually a binary search tree, um, but I'm not gonna get into how you how it's implemented, um, how the binary search tree is implemented. Um, all you need to know is that um, it stores unique elements and it kind of keeps them in a sorted order. So it supports the following uh, operation. So um, you can find uh, some element and that'll return an iterator pointing to uh, x, so find x would return an iterator that points to x, um, insert x, inserts x into the set. Uh, you can also erase, x uh, erases the element x. Uh, you can also erase by iterator, um, that would just erase the element uh, that the iterator points to. And uh, what we're especially interested in today uh, is the following functions. So we have um, lower bound x. This will return um, an iterator that points to the first element that is greater than or equal to x. And we'll see why this is very useful to us later. And there's also an upper bound function, and that returns an iterator uh, that points, oh, whoops, I made a typo. To the first element that is uh, strictly greater than x. And all you need to know about uh, sets is that it can support all of these operations in uh, O of log n time um, with respect to uh, the size of the set. So let's uh, try to, I'm, I know this is a little bit confusing at first, but um, I'm going to demonstrate every single uh, function here. So. For example, uh, let's just initialize a set of uh, integers and let's call that set S. And so you can initialize it with elements directly like this and you can put them in whatever order you want. Um, and I'm gonna put in some duplicate elements just to see uh, what happens when you have them in the set. So you can print out the elements uh, in the set just by going uh, for in K and S, let's print out K. Uh, let's make them space separated and let's output a new line. Okay, so uh, we had um, a lot of elements here and it looks like this uh, output didn't actually uh, output all the elements here and that would be uh, correct because uh, 
sets only store unique elements, right? So if we had a six here, uh, a six here and a six here, that would only count as one six. It won't keep both copies of the six. Um, if you did want to keep both copies, you would want to use a multi set, uh, which allows for duplicate elements. But um, this isn't necessary for us today. Um, so as you can see, you have uh, multiple copies of one number. So what it did was that, first of all, um, it ignored uh, duplicates of elements. And second of all, you can see that it printed the elements in uh, sorted order. So one, three, four, six, seven, nine, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it keeps the elements uh, in sorted order. So now let's try to find uh, a specific element. So if we tried to find the element seven, um, we would uh, it would return an iterator pointing to um, the element seven. So um, what you can do is, and if it doesn't find that thing, it should return dot n. So we can check that uh, seven is inside of the set by saying uh, s dot find um, seven. Uh, let's just output a boolean that indicates whether dot find seven was equal to uh, s dot end and if it returns false then we know that um, the set contains seven okay and it returned false so let's try to find something that is uh, not inside of the set so let's say the number a hundred Okay, and that would return one because it would reach uh, s dot end here because it didn't find anything. Okay, uh, now let's try to use the insert function. Uh, okay, so uh, now let's try to use the insert function. So let's say s dot insert, uh, we want to insert some random element into the set. Uh, let's say the number 12. And let's print out the set again. So. If we output that, we'll see that 12 is inserted into the set, and not only is it inserted, it's inserted in between uh, 10 and 23, which is exactly what we want, and it maintained the set uh, in the um, order that we wanted. So it maintained the set in non-decreasing order, which is uh, what its default is. So that's it for uh, insert, and we can try to erase an element. So uh, let's say we try to erase the element 7. So s dot erase seven, and let's compile and run that. And you can see that um, the seven is no longer in set, right? So it went from six to, straight to nine. So the set is now uh, one less, now has one less element than before. And uh, you can also erase by iterator. So if I said s dot erase, uh, s dot begin s dot begin is the iterator uh, pointing to the beginning of the set uh, I explained iterators briefly uh, in the first week but um, if you don't understand what iterators are they're just things that point to specific um, elements inside of the container so s dot begin for example points to the first element so um, we can also erase elements like that so we erase the first element which is one and um, yeah. So uh, now let's uh, use the lower bound and upper bound functions uh, methods that we'll be using today. So uh, this is going to return an iterator. So let's store that in some uh, iterator. I'll name that LB uh, for just for lower short for lower bound. And uh, let's say we wanted to find the lower bound of uh, eight. Uh, so let's say LBA equals s dot lower bound eight, and now let's print out this uh, the element that this iterator points to. Oops, and you have to dereference it with an asterisk before like that. Oh, whoops, that's not what I meant. And if you output, um, so again, what it does is that it it returns an iterator that points to the first element that is strictly greater than, no, sorry, not strictly greater. 
that is greater than or equal to x. So the first element that is uh, greater than or equal to 8 is 9. And even though, for example, 23 is greater than or equal to 8, um, it's not the first element that does that. So 9 would be the first element. Now, if we did instead um, lower bound of 7, uh, what it would do is that um, it says, okay, the first element that is greater than or equal to uh, 7 would be 7 because um, they're allowed to be equal. So um, that's the property of uh, lower bounds. And if instead we said um, upper bound of 7, then um, what upper bound uh, does again is that um, it returns an iterator that points to the first element that is strictly greater than x. So the first element that is strictly greater than 7 inside of this set would be 9. So we have a question. Uh, okay. I'm going to go to chat. This is Otto. Uh, so Otto will just determine uh, the type. Oh, I should be using um, uh, set int iterator like that um, but if you use the type auto then it'll just determine the type uh, at runtime I believe or at it'll just determine this appropriate type for the your variable so um, if I set that equal to s uh, upper bound uh, 7 then it knows that this will this is going to return an iterator and auto is just gonna say um, okay let's just uh, Auto is going to say, just set this, set the type of this variable to be whatever is appropriate here. So, um, so really it is set an iterator here, but uh, we just use auto to uh, make our code shorter. Uh, and if you wanted to, you could just uh, do this in one step and just um, say, dereference that iterator right away without storing it in a variable. And that would work just fine as well. Um, good question. Um, that's slow. Have I compiled it yet? Okay, yeah, and that would work uh, j just as well. Um, are there any questions as to how you would use a set? Check Discord again. Yeah, so it's kind of an adaptive um, type. Any downsides of using this? Um, it makes it a little bit less clear what your what the type of your variable is. Like, so if um, if you wanted to read your code later, um, uh, you would have to look a bit more carefully to uh, find out what type that variable is and what that variable stores again. I guess because you would have to look at um, what it's set equal to later on. If I were to use auto and it has adapted to int, if I were to use a different arg, how would this react? I'm a little bit confused by the question. If I were to use auto and it has adapted to int. Uh, no, okay, so um, you, you can't use the same variable uh, different data types um, I believe so actually we can just try, kind of test this out so let's say auto X is equal to zero and let's tr um, compile that and that should compile just fine um, uh, actually let's just output X as well so and by the way um, if you if your compiler doesn't support auto it's it might just be like old 
So, okay, so uh, saying auto x equals zero and we outputting x, that would be fine. But um, if it already has a type and you try to set it to like a string of um, ABC and you try to output that, um, I don't think this would work. So you, you can't, um, you can't store uh, more than one type here. So it says invalid conversion from uh, const char to int. So um, it determined that x was an integer the moment you set it equal to some integer there. Does that answer the question? Okay. Um, good question. So um, are there any questions about um, how to use sets in C++? Oh, by the way, um, if you did want to want something like a set in Python, so um, in Python you had something like set, um, you, what you're looking for is unordered set in C++, and that would give you a set of uh, elements that is uh, that still contains unique elements, but um, that would not be sorted in uh, any order. So you would be able to find stuff and uh, insert stuff in constant time, but you can't do the lower bound and upper bound stuff um, in uh, log in time so it supports it's less useful to us uh, in this particular context okay so if there are no further questions um, now that we know how to use a set uh, let's go back to the problem so um, let's go back to the question how can we insert a number into our sorted array or vector so the answer to this is don't use an array or vector um, use um, use a set so actually, let me undo what I just did there. Uh, we can use a set instead. So set is also called um, an ordered set just to differentiate between um, an unordered set. So um, if we instead maintain an ordered set, uh, what we can do to find the first cut to the right of mark X uh, is that we can do, um, let's say we initialized uh, a set X so we can uh, actually, let's name our set cuts. So if we had set and uh, cuts, and uh, initially we just have the cuts at 0 and L, right? And uh, we can use cuts dot lower bound x to find the um, iterator that points to the first cut to the right. Whoops. To the right of x and cuts and um, if you want to find the first cut to the left of mark x um, uh, and you go back to the list of functions here you don't actually find any function that um, returns the first element that is uh, let's say smaller than or smaller than or equal to x so what you can instead do is you can just decrement the iterator here and you can say um, the previous iterator uh, from cuts dot lower bound x uh, would point to the iterator that points to the first cut to the left of x. And so that's how we can uh, go ahead and find our um, go ahead and find our positions of the cuts to the left and right of the mark that uh, we need to calculate the length of. So and how can we insert a number? Um, we, well, uh, as demonstrated before, we can just use the cuts.insert um, x function to insert any uh, cut x into our function. And um, in this particular problem, they said that um, for both kinds of queries, uh, uh, one, two, it is guaranteed that there will, there will have been no cut at mark xi when the query is to be processed. So what this is saying is, um, for example, if you had a piece of wood that was uh, length 2, so 0, 1, 2, uh, if they made a cut here, they won't ask you, okay, uh, take the piece at mark 1, because y you'll see that there there is no piece at mark 1. It's it's already been separated at mark, at mark 1, so you won't be able to determine the length of that. And so in this context, using lower bound and upper bound is essentially equivalent, because um, you won't find anything that is equal to mark x when you uh, query it. So now uh, we can go ahead and implement our, our algorithm. So um, let's take an input. Um, uh, let's 
initialize or sorry let's declare our variables and let's uh, take them in from standard input using cn and i'm gonna just get the simple inputs here okay so we need to answer q query so um first of all let's initialize our set so let's make a set named cuts um, that's going to store um, stores the position positions of the cuts in sorted order so um, this is going to store uh, integers so we put in here so initially um, there there are technically no cuts at zero and L, but if we put them there, um, that's convenient for us because um, our lower bound and up, uh, previous of lower bound uh, will always be able to return uh, a number, so we don't have to handle casework in case that there's no cut to the left, um, if that makes any sense. So we have to process Q queries, so uh, it'll come in the form of C, I, X, I. So let's declare variable C and X and take them in from standard input. So they said, let's go back to the uh, problem statement. So if CI equals one, then they say cut the piece at mark XI into two. So if C is equal to one, then let's say cuts dot insert X because uh, cut stores the positions of the cuts. So if we want to cut at position X, then we insert it into our set. Otherwise, um, there's also there on, there's only one uh, option left, but I'm just gonna write out the condition to be um, clear. <coughs> Sorry. Um, let's go ahead and find um, our positions to the right or left and left. So let's uh, use lo the lower bound method to uh, find the first cut to the right of uh, x. So let's say right is equal to um, cuts dot lower whoops lower bound x and so this is going to store the iterator uh, pointing to the first cut to the right and so we can declare another one that's left and that's going to be equal to whatever um, that's going to be equal to um, the previous iterator. So the pre the element, sorry, the iterator that is before right, and that's going to give us the um, iterator pointing to the first cut to the left. And so um, how this works is, uh, for example, you had uh, a series of marks here. Um, let's say you had a series of cuts here and um, there was there was just a mark here and uh, if you say lower bound it's going to find you this cut right here and if you go back you'll you're guaranteed to find the alum, the first cut that, that is to the left if there was anything uh, in between here then lower bound would have found this instead so this can't exist right and if there was anything here then this would obviously point to that so pointing to the previous element would get us the first cut to the left. So now all we have to do is uh, dereference right and dereference left and just subtract, uh, take their difference. So let's say C out uh, right minus left. And let's see if that works. Okay, so um, that seems like it worked for all the samples. And uh, as always, let's calculate the time complexity of our um, algorithm. So uh, this loop is gonna run Q times. Uh, so that's, let's say that's O of Q. And uh, this insert function, that's going to be O of log, whoops, I should put that in common, O of log Q. And again, uh, the uh, set in C++ supports all these functions uh, in login uh, time with respect to the size of the set. So um, the set can go up to at most Q length. So the time complexity of each method here would be O of log Q. And you know, uh, lower bound and uh, upper bound, they're all uh, log Q as well. So um, we have, 
queue times, um, and each time either we perform a lock queue operation or another lock queue operation. So our whole program is going to have uh, the time complexity of O of Q log Q. And so if we look at the constraint of Q being equal to 2 times uh, 10 to the 5, if I'm not mistaken. Right, so 2 times 10 to the 5. So if we multiply by uh, the logarithm of 2 times 10 to the 5, and this is log base 2. So um, you can see that um, you can just estimate that this is uh, going to be less than 10 to the 8. So um, if they're multiplying, um, then they add. If you don't know what I'm doing, then this is just like logarithm rules. And then you can take the exponent of 5 in front. And so you can see that this is going to be, um, whoops, I need to put brackets here. So it's going to be some small constant that is um, going to be multiplied by 2 times 10 to the 5. And C++ is going to run at 10, uh, 10 to the power of 8 uh, operations per second, approximately. So we know that this uh, algorithm should be able to fit in uh, rather comfortably. Let's try to submit our algorithm. Okay, and uh, that passed all the test cases that satisfy the constraint. So, um, are there any questions as to uh, C++ sets or uh, any part of this problem, any part of this algorithm that, um, is there anything unclear about any of this? Any questions? When we use out, why is there a star in front of right, or right and left? Good question. So um, this is the dereference operator. So um, remember that um, right and left, these are iterators, right? So iterators are not the actual elements themselves. Their iterators point to the elements. So um, the purpose of an iterator in this uh, context is that iterators can go forwards and backwards to uh, traverse the container. So, for example, uh, we had an iterator that pointed pointed to the right, and I said, uh, if you take this, take the previous iterator that is um, before right, then uh, you would get left. So, iterator has the property that you can go forwards and backwards. So, um, iterators are not the actual elements themselves. If you use this dereference operator, um, that would get you the element that the iterator is pointing to. So if you didn't have this thing, then you wouldn't be able to output that because um, Cout doesn't know how to output iterators directly, right? And that's not what you want anyways. You want the elements that the iterators point to. And so you would add these uh, asterisks uh, just to um, uh, dereference the iterators and get the element that they're pointing to. Is that clear? Oh, uh, I guess, yeah, it's kind of similar in, in that sense. Um, but yeah, just remember that um, iterators point to elements and you, you can go forwards and backwards with them. Okay, um, if nobody has any questions, then we're going to move on and uh, look at a problem that's a little bit different than what we've been doing. So uh, this problem says, this morning, uh, the jury decided to add one problem to the problem set, and they said um, they have one, the printed, uh, they have printed its statement uh, in one copy, and now they need to make n more copies before the start. So they have one right now, and they want n more. And they have two copiers, um, one that copies a sheet in x seconds, the other in y seconds. And so um, they say you can use one copy or both at the same time, and you can copy not only from the original, but also from the copies. 
And so help them find out what is the minimum time they need to make n copies of the statement. So um, the key here um, is that uh, first of all, uh, you can you can't copy uh, you can't be using both copiers on the same paper. So um, you're gonna have to make one copy uh, of the copy that you already have. Um, to make both copiers work and since you want to uh, make n copies in the minimum time it makes sense that we want uh, both copiers to uh, start working so um, first let's uh, ask a simple question so um, how many copies can we make uh, with both copiers uh, given some amount of time t and so um, we can, uh, by recognizing that we need to make one copy at first with one of the copiers, uh, we can just uh, reduce the problem to this because um, first we, we want n copies and since uh, we have one copies, so we have one copy and we want uh, n more copies is what it says. So uh, to make both copiers, um, sorry uh, it's better to say to allow both copiers to work at the same time uh, m let's make one copy first and we if we want the minimum time um, then we want to make we want to let the copier that is the fastest to make this one copy right so let's initialize um, our uh, answer to um, minimum between X and Y so uh, in, we can either make one copy in x seconds or one copy in y seconds. So uh, if we just want to make one copy, then uh, we obviously use the one that's faster, right? And so now we just have to um, make n minus 1 more copies because we already made one copy here. So let's answer the question, how many copies can we make uh, with both copiers uh, given some amount of time t? What I want to do right now uh, is define a function t. So um, f at t, uh, uh, we I want to return. Um, so given some time t, I want to return the number of copies I can make. So um, we know that one can copy a sheet in x seconds, the other in y seconds. So the copier that can copy a sheet in x seconds, um, if you give it t seconds, then it can make t over x copies, right? And so um, I'm not sure why I put a space, but and the other copier that can copy one sheet every y seconds, um, then if you give it t seconds, it can um, copy t over y. Uh, it can make t over y copies, right? And so um, the f at t would be equal to uh, t over x plus uh, t over y, and that would uh, be the total number of uh, copies that you can make given uh, some time t. Now obviously you can't make half of a copy or a third of a copy, so uh, what I'm implying here is that we should take we should take the floor, uh, whoops, the floor of t of x. But since division uh, on integers is going to truncate anyways, and we're dealing with positive integers, uh, it's just going to um, truncate it for us. It's going to floor the integers, positive integers for us. And so what can what we can recognize here is that f at in the more time you uh, give the copiers the more copies they can make and what this means algebraically is that um, the larger t is the larger this output will be and so um, what we can say here um, actually uh, let's try to vi visualize this with uh, Desmos so um, So if we had a function, uh, can I use t in Desmos? I, I hope I can. Actually, I'll just use x. So f at x equals uh, x over, um, let's say, x over a um, plus x over b. Oops. And uh, let's just um, let's set a to be 
uh, a and b to some value in between one and ten just like how the constraints say it so it's uh, x and y is between one and ten so if a and b are somewhere in between we can see that we have a line here so our function is actually just a line and that makes sense because um if the uh if the input um which is the x here is the amount of time we give it and the output is the number of copies it can make since uh, the definition of our function is how much how many copies can you make with x seconds right so the more time you give it so the larger the x uh, the more copies it can make so the, the larger the y so it's going to be a line that is trending upwards and so formally uh, we can say uh, f at x is greater than or equal to f at y uh, if for all x is greater than y so greater than or equal to y so um, we call it, we would call this a monotonic function and so what that means is that um, it never uh, it is non decreasing uh, or non uh, increasing so it only goes uh, either flat or up or it only goes flat or down and then in this case it only goes up so uh, we would call that a non decreasing function and since it's a monotonic function um, we can use binary search on it now when we did binary search um, on the array um, we had the fact that the array was sorted in um, non-decreasing order. So that was what made it possible for us to reject half of the interval whenever we uh, at each iteration, right? So here we're going to do something very similar. We're going to have our interval as um, let's say time is equal to uh, actually it, it'll become easier as I uh, implement it. So um, so now uh, we need to find the minimum t such that f at t is greater than or equal to n minus 1, right? Because we want to make n minus 1 more copies, and we need to find the minimum time such that we can make n minus 1 copies or more. So um, what we're going to do uh, to solve this is to use binary search. So um, let's take it, let's define declare a function um, Let's define a function uh, int f, just like uh, how we uh, described it, and let's return uh, t over x plus t over y. And C++ follows the order of operations, though we, we don't really need brackets. And for uh, simplicity, let's declare these uh, variables globally so they don't get confused when uh, x and y aren't declared. So uh, let's take an input of um, n, x, and y. And so uh, uh, remember how I said we have to uh, make one copy at first? Well, um, we can actually do that uh, later just to make our implementation a bit easier. So uh, what we're going to do is, um, so we have an interval. So either uh, it's going to take somewhere in between uh, 0 and some very large number uh, that we have yet to find out what it is. Um, so how much time at most are we going to uh, need to make the copies? Well, um, if we have to make n copies, so um, if uh, f at t is, um, uh, is the smallest possible, then x and y are the biggest possible. So uh, what we would say is um, that would be t over the biggest possible x and y are 10 so t plus 10 uh, t, sorry t over 10 plus t over 10 so that would give us uh, f at t uh, equals t over 5 is our worst case so um, if we set t over 5 uh, equal to uh, 2 times 10 to the 8 which is the maximum amount of copies that we're going to need to make as uh, according to the constraints then we can say uh, t, um, the largest t, t will be um, is 10 times 10 to the 8, which is equal to 10 to the 9. So we know that um, our search interval of t is going to, in uh, going to be in between uh, 0 and 10 to the power of 9. So uh, let's do exactly that. So let's have our low point be 0. And let's have our high point be uh, 10 to the power of 9. And again, we're going to declare a, a variable called answer, which is going to uh, 
uh, let's say answer equals zero at first. So this stores the um, minimum time uh, that, oh, I should not declare that as zero actually, that we need to make n minus one copies. So let's run our binary search algorithm. So while our interval is not empty, we're going to check for the condition that um, actually, first of all, we're going to choose the middle point. So mid is equal to low plus high over two. And let's check the condition. So if f of mid is um, greater than or equal to n minus one, so if we can make n minus one copies or more, if we can make n minus one copies with time mid, then try to use less time, right? So instead, um, so we're, we're going to update answer to mid, first of all. And also, we're going to, um, we're going to have our search space be uh, mid minus one, because we're going to try to use less time than before. So anything that is um, greater than mid, um, if we reach this condition, anything that is greater than mid will definitely work. But since we want to find the minimum time, uh, it is not useful to us. Now, otherwise, we're going to have our search interval be um, mid plus one because um, let me put this in braces, actually. So if we can't make n minus one copies, use more time. So um, we're going to set our low point to the right of mid. So going back to our line here. So if this point, um, so if I chose 10, for example, and I actually need six copies, we, we can see that at position 10, um, the Y value does not, uh, is smaller than six. So we would reject anything to the left of it because that would give us a smaller Y value and we'd go towards a bigger X value to achieve a larger Y value. So that's the logic behind that, and um, we need to, we needed to make that one extra copy just for the uh, min uh, x y. So um, we're going to output answer uh, added on to the uh, minimum between x and y. Uh, should I? Hmm. I guess I don't have to. Okay, um, so now let's try to uh, run our program against the sample inputs. Okay, and they worked for, sam for the samples and um, now uh, let's try to, uh, as always, analyze uh, the time complexity of our algorithm. So um, we know that uh, binary search cuts our search interval uh, in half uh, every single time. And since uh, the high point goes up to uh, t 10 to the power of 9, which is, uh, let's say, 5 times n, um, let's say we, uh, if we use um, instead like 5 times n, then this algorithm would be uh, O of log n, right? Because uh, we're cutting the search interval between low and high into two uh, every time. Sorry, give me one second. Okay, I'm back. Um, so let's try to uh, submit this solution. Oh, uh, did I compare? Oh, no, I didn't yet. Okay, so the log of uh, 10 to the power of nine uh, would be uh, equivalent to nine times the uh, logarithm of 10. And so the logarithm of 10 is obviously a very small constant. So this is just going to be constant time. So um, for those of you that know, this is gonna be uh, around maybe 30 operations. So that should run very, very fast. Uh, I'm not sure why I'm actually compiling it again, but um, so let's try to submit this. Uh, 
Okay, while that's loading, um, are there any questions as to what I did here? So any questions about um, how we uh, solve this problem, it's just declaring uh, the function and using binary search to binary search for the minimum time. Okay, um, since no one has any questions, uh, I'm going to move on to um, a slightly different one. So uh, this was binary searching on a monotonic function, and we're still going to stay on uh, that idea, except this time we'll be dealing with uh, real numbers or doubles in C++. So, um, this problem uh, statement is very simple. It says, find a number x such that x squared plus square root of x is equal to c, and c is the constant that they're going to input. And so um, uh, this uh, question kind of already has the function uh, declared for you. So uh, let's say f at x is equal to x squared plus square root of, of x. And so in C++, there is a, a function called uh, SQRT, which will give you the square root. Um, and so we need to, uh, and you know that um, the x squared increases uh, as x increases and the square root of x increases as s x increases. So again, we can say f at x is greater than or equal to f at y uh, for, for all x is greater than or equal to y. And so, well, how about is greater than or equal to zero? Uh, just to make things um, not complicated, because we are, uh, anyways, we are getting only positive integers here. So um, <clears throat> again, we have a monotonic function function here. So this is going to be another non-decreasing. Uh, function so uh, we can binary search for the required x to satisfy this now you might ask um, so square root of x x squared we might end up having uh, to have a net ir irrational sorry yeah irrational x to satisfy this equation but um, the key here is that the answer will be considered correct if the relative or absolute error is not more than 10 to the negative 6 and so what that means is that um, your x only has to be really close to the answer, and it doesn't have to be uh, exactly the answer. So um, <clears throat> what we're going to do here is uh, something called uh, binary searching on uh, real numbers. So uh, let me get the input. So um, let's declare this function f at x. And we're going to return uh, x squared, which uh, is x times x, added on to the square root of x. Oh, sorry. Uh, this is a mistake that I make often, which is using integers instead of doubles when dealing with real numbers. So when dealing with real numbers, you should always be using uh, doubles or long doubles if necessary. Um, so let's take an input of c. So uh, double c. And let's take that in from the input. And so uh, what we're going to do uh, is very similar to what we did before, except we're going to use doubles. So let's say double low is equal to 0, and our high would be equal to, so <clears throat> you see c goes up to 10 to the 10. So the maximum x that we're going to need, uh, let's say, is around uh, 10 to the power of 5, because um, if we're just looking at the first term here, um, 
10 to the 5 squared is equal to 10 to the 10. And so add it on to some uh, non-negative uh, value. That's going to give us a value that's uh, big enough. So let's set our high point equal to uh, 10 to the power of 5. And uh, in this case, it's uh, not necessary for us to declare an answer variable. Um, you'll see why later. So our search interval is between low and high again. Now, uh, we know that uh, low will always be uh, less than or equal to high if we keep on setting it to the... Um, because we're not using integers anymore. We're using doubles. And between, let's say, um, two integer values, there are an infinite amount of um, numbers in between one and two. So not necessarily integers. So you can have like fractions. You can have like rational numbers. Obviously, computers can't store irrational numbers. But uh, still, uh, all you have to do is uh, say if the distance between the high point and the low point is greater than or equal to um, some constant here. So let's say uh, 10 to the power of uh, negative 7, because um, they said the relative or absolute error is not more than 10 to the negative 6. So if we just make the accuracy uh, a little bit uh, just slightly more uh, accurate than what they want it to be, uh, I think we'll be fine. So um, we're, again, we're going to choose a middle point, and uh, we're going to use everything we're going to declare everything as doubles, so mid is equal to low plus high over 2. And uh, what we want to check is uh, if f at uh, this middle point is greater than c, then we're going to say, um, since it's greater, uh, then we need to choose a smaller mid so that f at mid can evaluate into something uh, smaller, right? because f at x is greater than f at y for all x is greater than y uh, that is positive or non-negative. So uh, we want to set our high point equal to mid. Now we don't want to set it equal to mid minus 1 because that would exclude the interval uh, between mid minus 1 and mid. And when we're dealing with integers that would be fine but now that we're dealing with doubles we can't be skipping over any intervals like that so we would just set high equal to mid otherwise let's set our low value equal to mid okay and finally um, when we get to a point where um, high minus low is less than uh, 10 to the power of negative 7 we know that uh, if we just pick um, any value that is between low and high the absolute val uh, uh, the absolute error um, uh, or the deviation from uh, the answer uh, will not be more than 10 to the negative 6. So we can just pr uh, output that. So we can out we can just choose either high or low or anything in between, and that should work just fine. So let's try to run this program. Oh, I forgot one thing. So um, if we try to do that, um, we might not have enough uh, decimal output. Uh, in here and it might start outputting stuff in uh, scientific notation and remember the first week I said um, if you want to output doubles with a lot of uh, digits you would use cout fixed and set precision so let's set our precision to uh, something that is gr uh, more precise than 10 to the negative 6 so let's set that say um, precision to 8 and uh, now let's output the answer and you're going to see that it stops rounding our answer, uh, but also um, you can see our answer is not perfectly accurate, but that's fine because the error, the difference between this and uh, this is uh, much smaller than 10 to the power of negative 6. So we should still be getting the correct answer here. So that is how you binary search on real numbers. So a couple things is that um, you should use doubles for all your values, um, and you should use long doubles if necessary. And um, our, your condition becomes the distance between the high and the low point um, becomes greater than or equal to some constant. And uh, again, use everything as doubles. And if it's greater than it, then you want to set your high point equal to um, the middle. And if it's smaller, then you want to set your low point to the middle. And that's because our function is a non-decreasing function. If we had a non-increasing function, that would be the opposite, right? And finally, um, we're left with um, the answer is somewhere in between high and low. And um, 
outputting any of those is fine because uh, the distance between them is so small that um, the error, it can't deviate from the answer that is uh, more than 10 to the power of negative seven. And that's good enough for this problem. So um, let's try to submit this. Okay, uh, meanwhile, uh, are there any questions about this problem and how we use uh, doubles to binary search on real numbers? So no questions. Okay, does anyone want to guess uh, approximately how many operations we're doing here? This one might be a little bit uh, tricky. You can also say like how you would get to the answer. So you don't have to like say the exact answer, but as long as you give the correct process, that's fine as well. Right, yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, this one uh, is a bit hard, so I'll just give it away. Um, so. You want to search for a real number in between 0 and uh, 10 to the power of 5. But so at first glance, it might look like uh, we're taking approximately 10 to the power of 5 operations. But this is actually not true because we won't stop just when we uh, when our search interval becomes uh, 1 or less um, because um, we have to search through. Um, we have to search until the distance between them is uh, greater than, uh, sorry, is less than uh, 10 to the power of negative seven. So uh, actually we would have to be uh, the, uh, what, 10 to the power of five divided by uh, 10 to the power of negative seven would actually give us uh, 10 to the power of 12. And so the logarithm of that is still not bad, but um, just remember that there is this, uh, there's a couple extra um, orders of magnitude here when we're uh, searching on real numbers and requiring them to uh, be um, very precise like that. Oh, and our solution got accepted. So, um, so are there any questions about uh, what we did here? So. Uh, I think uh, I already asked this, but um, if there are any questions on uh, binary searching on any of the problems that uh, we did today, um, go ahead and ask. And uh, if you ever come up with a question later, you can always ask in the Discord server. Um, what I wanted to do was to... Uh, I'll give you guys... Uh, five minutes to uh, use what you learned today and try to solve this problem and uh, after five minutes we'll uh, take up the solution so uh, go ahead and try this problem okay so uh, let's come back and uh, let's uh, does anyone have any ideas as to how we can uh, begin to solve this problem you don't need to have the full solution just uh, uh, any ideas that might help us?
binary search starting uh, with the lower bound as zero and the upper bound as the minimum of all the ropes. Um, okay, so uh, do you mind explaining why you chose the upper bound to be the minimum of all the ropes? Okay, it does somewhat seem like the problem is saying that, but um, it's it, uh, the problem might be a little bit confusing. So what it's actually saying is there are n ropes, and you just need to cut out uh, k pieces of the same length. So um, say I had um, like a rope of length uh, three and a rope of length uh, two. Then um, if I wanted to ask um, how many, uh, what is the maximum piece uh, length of the pieces I can get if I just want one, uh, if k equals to one. So uh, you need, if I need to cut uh, one piece uh, of the same length, then um, the number, the maximum length of pieces I can get is actually just three. So um, I don't necessarily need to cut out um, three from all of them. I just need to find this. I just need to be able to cut out uh, a rope of length uh, three from, I just need to be able to cut out K ropes of length three. And in the case that K is equal to one, I can just have three directly like that. So the problem uh, was a little bit confusing um, uh, in that sense, but binary searching is certainly the right idea here. So, um, Anyways, oh, someone's typing. Uh, I'm confused in what the question is asking. Okay, um, so it says that uh, there are n ropes, and you need to cut out k pieces of the same length from them. So find the maximum uh, length of pieces you can get. So <clears throat> you need to find uh, the maximum number L such that um, you can cut out K pieces. Um, wow, I can't write here. You need to cut out K pieces of length L. So um, I'm not sure why I'm writing it on here instead of typing it in my editor. I should probably do that. Uh, so it's, so it's asking um, what is the maximum length L such that uh, we can cut out K pieces of length L from the N uh, ropes. So um, let's try to binary search on the value L. So let's declare a function um, so uh, how, let's ask the question, how many um, ropes of length L can we cut out uh, given some uh, length L? So let's define uh, F of L to uh, return the number of ropes we can cut out of length L. Oops. So uh, we need to cut them out um, out of the n ropes, right? So um, for each rope, um, uh, so we have n ropes, and we can cut try to cut out uh, a length, a rope of length l from uh, each of the ropes. So if we had a rope of length, if we had a rope of length, uh, let's say a we can cut out um, the floor of A over L uh, pieces of rope with length L, right? So for example, if we had a rope that was, 
that had length um, six. And we want to cut out ropes of length two. Um, that, that would be six over two. So we would be able to cut out three pieces and we would make a cut here and cut here. And so two, 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 and we'd get three pieces of length two. That's not good three. So if we had a piece of length four and we wanted to cut out a, uh, a piece of length, uh, let's say five, um, we would see that this would not be possible. So uh, the flo floor of four over five um, would be equal to zero. So we can't cut out any um, ropes uh, of length five from a piece of rope that is length four. Does that make sense? So for, uh, for every rope, calculate how many ropes of length L we can cut out for that uh, from that rope and sum up all uh, sum up the number of ropes uh, from each rope. So let's uh, declare the function uh, to do this for us. Uh, so would the upper bound be the max of the ropes. Yeah, uh, it would. So. It doesn't make sense to uh, cut out a rope that is uh, that has length greater than the max of all the ropes because you would just get a zero for every single one and that would not be useful. And uh, they did say k is uh, strictly greater than a zero, so uh, there's no point in having that, I guess. So let's declare a function uh, that helps us, uh, the f at l that we just described up here. So int f at uh, length, whoops, I've been misspelling that all day. Um, let's uh, return an integer, um, uh, hmm. rope count, uh, and let's initialize that to zero. And so uh, let's say our ropes were uh, indexed from uh, one to n, so Let's loop through all the loop ropes. So i equals one, i is smaller than or equal to n, plus plus i. Um, let's add on to add on to rope count um, the floor of the length of the rope. So let's have an array called um, lengths, I guess. That makes sense. And um, it goes up to ten to the four. Actually, I can just I guess put this. So the floor of the uh, length of the current rope over the length that we want. And so that would be the amount of uh, the number of ropes we can cut out of this length from this particular rope. And so let's just return uh, that answer. And the length can be a double. So I almost made that mistake there. And let's return the uh, rope count at the end. So again, we're uh, binary searching on real numbers. So let's take let's take an input uh, of n and k. So um, I sh let's make these global so my function uh, doesn't think stuff is undeclared, not declared. And um, let's take an input of n and k. And um, Let's loop through uh, from one to n to uh, take in the input. So let's say c in lengths at i. So that takes input um, into this array here, and we want to store the number of um, we want to store the uh, lengths of each rope inside of lengths. So oh, it, it copied onto here for some reason. Whoops. Okay, so now let's uh, start to run our binary search. So um, again, we're going to do the same thing as before. Uh, we're going to use doubles, and um, I made a mistake here. Um, the lengths here uh, are, uh, they did say uh, they were, oh no, they just said they were numbers and not necessarily integers. So we, we have to use double for the data type of lengths as well. 
So let's set our low point as equal to zero and let's set our um, Uh, let's set our high point uh, to be the max um, among all the ropes and the maximum that it can be is 10 to the power of 7. So instead of actually computing the max, you can just um, say, well, what is the worst case? The worst case is that the maximum of them is um, 10 to the power of 7. So let's just do that. And while the distance between them is smaller, uh, is greater than the um, some constant, so again, um, it's correct if the absolute error or relative error doesn't exceed t uh, 10 to the power of negative 6. So let's say we want the distance to be less than 10 to the power of negative 7. And again, let's pick a middle point, low plus high over 2 to take the average. And if um, our function evaluates uh, mid, if that is greater than or equal to k, because we, we need to cut at least k pieces of the same length, then let's um, the um, if we can cut at least uh, k pieces with mid uh, number of with uh, of ropes with length mid, then we know that we can make our length even even greater. So um, let's set our low point equal to mid. Um, otherwise, let's set our high point equal to mid. So what this says is. Um, we can cut uh, more than k, uh, actually the equals is not necessary. We can cut more than k um, ropes of length mid and try cutting longer ropes. And that's because we wanna uh, find the maximum length of pieces that I can get. So otherwise this says, um, uh, we can cut, uh, we cannot cut k ropes of length mid, try um, cutting shorter ropes. And so we're setting high is equal to mid in this case. And in the end, we're just going to output um, low or high, it doesn't matter too much. And remember to use a fixed and set precision when dealing with doubles. And let's just output low for uh, simplicity. And I think let's just compile it and run it. And I did something wrong somewhere. Hmm. Oops. Okay, um, so my error was that um, I forgot that um, if it's equal, then we should we can also try cutting longer ropes, and um, uh, not only if it's greater. So um, remember to, to uh, have your condition here um, correspond to what the question asked for. And now we're outputting a two hundred point four nine 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 nine, which is a uh, very close to uh, the desired answer of uh, two hundred and five. And so. Um, Again, if we analyze the approximate number of uh, operations we're doing here, um, so we're going up to 10 E7, and we're going uh, as precise as uh, 10 to the power of negative seven, and we divide that, we should get maybe somewhere around 10 to the power of 14. But the logarithm of that is still uh, very small, so maybe around 14 times log 10. So this is just some very small constant. Um, so this, should, this program should still run pretty fast. Um, are there any questions about um, this problem and how we solved it? Uh, you're a bit confused. Um, what? what what exactly uh, do you not understand? Like, is, is it the problem or a particular part of the solution? I think he said that before. So like before you took up the solution. Oh, okay. 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 So um, are, are there any other questions? Uh -huh. 
Okay, um, all of these uh, solution files that we went over today, um, we'll, I'll be posting them on GitHub so you can uh, go ahead and review them uh, later um, if you want to. And um, you can always ask uh, questions on the Discord server uh, if you have, if you're confused about anything. Um, there will be a recording uh, posted uh, maybe somewhere around the weekend. And um, there are some practice problems at the bottom that so I'm just waiting for this to load okay so um, there are some practice problems that I put here um, I might add some easier ones um, these are these might be a little hard um, but um, they do, they are um, solvable with what uh, the concepts that we learned today. Um, don't worry about the rest of whatever this file has, um, d and don't don't mistake the practice problems for um, what you're uh, what I'm uh, giving to you today. Um, so just ignore whatever is uh, is in the rest of the doc, and uh, just go ahead and try some of these practice problems if you want. Um, and uh, I think. That should be it for today. So today we went over uh, some different forms of binary search. We went over some binary search trees and binary searching on functions and real numbers. And um, so if you again, if you have any questions, um, you can ask now and you can ask at any time uh, on the Discord server. And um, have a good day. Thank you for coming. Oh yeah, I just want to say something uh, real quick before we leave. Yeah. So just like for the practice problems, I know like some people are busy, especially since it's like grade 11 and grade 12 mostly. Uh, so just try to do at least one question because, you know, if you like don't do it, it makes it a lot easier to forget what you learned. But at least doing one is it's like much better than doing zero. Yes, that is true. And I think for most of these problems, um, there are editorials. Um, so you, if, if you get, get stuck, you don't have to waste hours just uh, trying to think about where you went wrong. You can just uh, go to the solution and uh, find out how it's actually solved if you get stuck. So uh, there's that. So uh, try some of the problems. Uh, have fun. We'll see you next week uh, with some different content. And uh, have a good day. Goodbye.